The year is 2002. It's the holiday season and maybe you're expecting to get a brand new PlayStation 2 or Nintendo GameCube for Christmas. But with such a great selection of games, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, Metroid Prime, Super Mario Sunshine, what would you choose? Well, maybe you were like me, excited to see your favorite Purple Dragon's big move to next-gen hardware. The original trilogy went out with a bang on the PS1, so bringing Spyro to PS2 could only be a step in the right direction, right? Right? Hey guys, it's Miharu. Spyro Enter the Dragonfly, a game infamous for its troubled development history. A game that resulted in the closure of a studio, the game that killed whatever chance Spyro had of becoming a household name, and it all happened 20 years ago. Spyro Enter the Dragonfly was one heck of a gem that was seen as an attempt to recreate the feel of the original PlayStation Spyro games, but with modern graphics. It's a shame that a game from such a beloved series could even have such a tainted history, but sometimes that's just the way it happens. I was probably around 10 or maybe even 11 years old when I first got Enter the Dragonfly, and I think even back then I could tell something was off. The character models, the way it controlled, it wasn't exactly Spyro the way I had known it, but I gave it a chance anyway. I actually used to think I was crazy, that I had a bad copy or something, since no one else seemed to be experiencing the numerous glitches the game is so well known for, or at least that's what they would tell me. Then I started using the internet, and I realized I'm definitely not alone on this. I think I got about as far as the level Thieves Den before I just gave up on it and ended up selling it at a garage sale or something. And then just recently, I added it back to my collection. How is it possible that it's actually worse than I remember? Spyro Enter the Dragonfly is a game with strong ambition, but plagued by horrendous decisions. Even I find it as a wasted opportunity to introduce Spyro to a wider hardware range as outside the PS2, namely the GameCube. Production on Enter the Dragonfly, which I'll be referring to as ETD, began shortly after the release of Year of the Dragon. It was being developed by Czech Six, who was in charge of all the programming and engine work, with Equinox handling a vast majority of art assets for the game. Both companies were made up of a mix of seasoned professionals, as well as some who were new to the industry. Now, on a surface level, this might seem a very open and shut case, but there were many factors that led to this game earning its notorious reputation. Rushed game development the toxic workplace environment the development teams had to endure, and many ideas that were tossed aside over and over. See, according to former employees, the working conditions at Check 6 were less than acceptable, resulting in a lot of missed paychecks and many people quitting before the game was even completed. On top of that, it didn't help matters that the higher-ups at Universal kept pushing them to get the game done by Holiday of 02. Despite it originally being slated for 01, which frankly was never going to happen. I wasn't a bright kid then, nor am I very bright now, but even I could see that the game had quite a few issues to say the least. Story-wise, the best way to describe ETD is a combination of Spyro 2 and 3, but the lazy version. The story for this game is pretty bland and forgettable, and chances are, you won't really care about it as you play through the game. I still have no idea why they decided to bring Ripto back, considering he actually fell in love with the last time we saw him. And no, the game doesn't explain it. In an interview with level designer Scott Smith, this wasn't always the case. Originally, the plot involved an evil dragon siphoning the essence from other dragons in order to make himself more powerful. Spyro would then go around collecting the dragon essences and eventually defeat the villain. It was the producer, Ricky Rukavina, who told them to scrap that concept, simply stating that there were no evil dragons in the Spyro universe. Until two years later, but that's beside the point. Also, Ripto's back somehow? They should've just made a new villain or just brought Nasty Nork back. On the topic of Nasty Nork, reports by various news outlets revealed that he was actually meant to return alongside Ripto, just like the epilogue of Spyro 3 suggested. In fact, traces of Nasty can still be found in the game, in the form of statues. 
According to Scott, it was Ricky's call to bring back Ripto, and in doing so, the whole capturing Dragonfly story had to essentially be shoehorned in. And that's not all. Apparently, he wanted so badly to be lead designer that he would constantly force his own ideas on the team at Check 6, even going so far as to draw out level designs without consulting anyone. In Scott's own words, Ricky was a major influencer as to why the game didn't do as well as it should have. If this game didn't have Spyro in the title, it would have just been called a Bunk's Paradise since the game was just filled with them. I think we all have heard the horror stories of the game. Deloading levels, you know, glitchy hitboxes, clipping everywhere. Cut corners, rush coding, and a plethora of glitches. Yes, the game does have a lot of bugs. There's a lot of glitches. The many bugs and glitches. The bugs and glitches. It's one of the most unfinished and broken games I've ever seen. Alright, this is what you're all here for. This is what we all remember, right? Of course it is. The one thing you probably know about ETD, whether you've played it or not, is that it's riddled with these types of problems. Let's start with the way it feels to control. Yeah, if you were expecting traditional Insomniac-style gameplay, you won't find it here. Now, I'm not about to say Spyro's controls have always been perfect, but at least there was a basic understanding of movement. Unfortunately, the controls and the physics are not fun. Spyro does not move or platform as smoothly as he did in his previous games, and the bugs and glitches I've encountered further compound this problem. It all effectively makes Enter the Dragonfly one of the worst handling Spyro console games of all time. This is probably the floatiest game I've ever played. There's absolutely no weight to anything. Spyro jumps like he's on the moon, you have barely any control over your turning, thank god there are no supercharged challenges, and the enemies take a ride on a slip and slide before disappearing. Certain effects or actions will cause the frame rate to chug and overall it just feels very unpolished. Interestingly enough, the game was intended to run at 60 frames per second, but ultimately did not end up doing so due to time constraints, an error prone engine, and insufficient assets. This game has long loading times? It took like a minute, which is very unacceptable. Oh, don't get me started on those loading screens. I timed it, it's about 50 seconds on the PS2 version and only slightly better on GameCube. This was such a problem that at one point developers even planned to have music play over these screens, which would have made it only slightly more bearable. That said, there are some fantastic ideas in this game. Unlocking multiple elemental breaths is such a perfect addition to Spyro's moveset that it became a staple of the franchise. A majority of the gameplay centers around using new breath abilities to complete various tasks. As this memorable trailer for the game states, We ain't just a fire hazard anymore! You have your standard flame, ice breath, which was previously used for singular occasions in Spyro 2 and 3, Electricity to power up generators and move platforms, and... bubbles? Yes, bubble breath is what you'll be using to catch the dragonflies which are scattered throughout the dragon realms. Not only is it kind of a lame idea to introduce an ability that's only useful for one objective and nothing else, but that happens to be the main goal of the game. So you're constantly having to switch back and forth between breaths that actually do something and... this. It's incredibly tedious and downright frustrating at times, especially since the dragonflies tend to move around a lot and become hard to keep up with. Another new ability is that of the wing shield, which again is only used for one purpose and half the time doesn't even work right. I really enjoy the Spyro formula and it does have that, but it's a bit too slow for me. I guess, I guess it's just a bit too different. Mini games, while mostly a mixed bag, actually have some unique ideas that still haven't been seen in any other Spyro titles to this day. Luau Island's Tiki Drum Challenge plays quite well for it being a simple game of Simon Says, and the platform challenges found in Crop Circle Country and Thieves' Den put your platforming skills to the test. Even the speedways are expanded versions of their respective levels and feature eccentric enemies of their own. The graphics look worse than the older game that came out before, even though it came out on stronger hardware. Something you're bound to notice right off the bat is these, uh, wonderfully enhanced character models. What exactly happened there? Oh gosh, how did this even get past quality assurance? This is beyond any nightmare fuel I've ever seen. Well, the developers wanted to stay as true as possible to the art style of the original trilogy. This involved playing Spyro 3 in the office to use certain characters or aspects as references, like when animating Spyro's flame effect. 
But more to the point, ETD's character models were constantly getting redesigns, as well as getting their polygon count lowered just to get the game to run at an acceptable frame rate. Which it still doesn't, so great job. Nothing in this game was designed with any care or attention to detail. Actually, not true. Despite the aforementioned problems, there are some positive points to discuss. For example, the NPCs fit right in amongst those in the trilogy. Each of them have their own personality, accent, and problems Faro needs to solve. Even the enemies have tons of personality, particularly in their idle animations that are easy to miss as they only occur when Spyro is far away from them. It's clear that Equinox spent a great deal of time trying to individualize each character, but went a bit overboard with the effects, resulting in these stretchy-faced abominations. The current models look bad, but the levels look good. Uh, it's probably good, sonically and visually. Like the original trilogy, the proposed plan for ETD was multiple homeworlds with tons of different levels to explore. A design document from 2001 details a total of 20 areas, including four homeworlds themed around weather in a similar fashion to Spyro 2. But as you know, what we ended up getting was barely a fraction of that, with only one hub and eight levels. From an aesthetic standpoint, the level designs are actually one of the better aspects of this game. They're all unique, colorful, and feel like expanded versions of something Insomniac would have made. The problem mostly lies in the non-linear layout making some of them confusing to navigate. The area I feel like is the weakest overall in the game are the levels and the objectives within the levels and how they really add up to what the game expects of you. It lacks direction for the player. You don't have any real sense of direction or what you're supposed to be doing in each world. I feel like I have to loop around several times before I finally get all the information I need to complete my current task. Objectives originally were more complex, as both Hunter and even the Dragon Elders had a ton more interaction with Spyro, as evident by this early screenshot. The gameplay was not that great. It suffered from being too big of an open world with little to do in that space. A standard level from Spyro 3 on average takes about 20 minutes to complete, whereas ETD's levels hold you there for up to a half an hour longer than that, and that's if you're going for everything. But when you're given no incentive to explore, as you're likely to get sick of rescuing dragonflies and gems are completely worthless, the whole thing becomes tiresome real quick. And just like Spyro 3, this game also has a true 100% ending in the form of a simple cutscene. Not worth it. The music, done by Stuart Copeland, is amazing of course, notably different from the first three games but with its own style, usually calm, ambient, and surprisingly melancholy at times. I first found the music and I thought it was great. It may surprise you to learn that, though he took all of the credit, Stuart Copeland was not the sole composer for this game. Like with Ear of the Dragon, he chose to collaborate on ETD's soundtrack. The additional composers would create a bass mix, which would then be touched up and given more of a Spyro feel with Copeland's instrumentation. Because of this, the music takes on several styles and provides a diverse, world-like feel. Over 45 individual tracks were made, with only 28 making it to the final game. Bringing Copeland back was yet another one of Ricky's ideas, and one he was quite fixated on to make sure the game sounded like Spyro. And though it worked out, it wasn't without consequence, as this was ultimately the nail in the coffin that made Copeland quit composing for the series. He recalls seeing that live-action farm ad and not recognizing it as Spyro at all, which is when he felt disconnected to the series and that Universal and himself weren't on the same page anymore. Enter the Dragonfly is a game that was doomed to fail from the start. Enter the Dragonfly is a real enigma of a game. This game has wasted potential written all over it. Growing up on the original trilogy, to this day, I still feel Enter the Dragonfly brought nothing new or interesting to Spyro as a series. It was a mess. It really was. It's the Sonic 06 of Spyro games. One of the worst games I have ever played. This game is atrocious. That's putting it mildly. The game fucking sucks. Overall, this game is an embarrassment to what came before it. Even one of the programmers recalls that the version of the game he played during his time at Check 6 was nothing like the one that was shipped, describing the final product as boring and terrible. Most people who've played this game tend to describe it as being rushed. I feel bad for the developers. 
and I do feel they should have had more time working on this game, similar to Crash Twin Sanity, because they were rushed to meet a deadline. Most of the game's problems actually come from the game being rushed. Rush development. Well, he was. Rushed. Rushed. And considering what we got, I can see how one could easily think that. But funnily enough, that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, developers laugh at the thought, as most of the concerns during production were about if the game would even get finished at all, due to the constant design changes. I think the biggest problem with ETD as a whole is that everything feels pointless. You never really feel like you're working toward a goal, you're just doing a bunch of stuff because you have to. The simplest way to explain it is, imagine the GBA games on a grander scale, but with even more technical issues. Despite how controversial it turned out though, it's important to note it does have its fans who enjoyed their time playing it. I've had many fond memories of playing Spyro games when I was younger, including Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. Spyro Enter the Dragonfly was my gateway into the Spyro franchise. If it wasn't for Enter the Dragonfly, I would have never discovered the Spyro franchise. I found myself liking the unfinished glitch fest of a Spyro experience more so than the more polished Jack and Daxter clone. Really, uh, it comes down to whether you enjoy the experience or not, and for me, I kinda do. Overall, I think that game is a really great game. I really enjoyed playing Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. Enter the Dragonfly marked a major turning point in the series as a whole. It was the end of the classic Spyro era as we knew it, as this was the last game we would see in the original style until reignited over 15 years later. But there's a lot to thank it for, too. As mentioned previously, it was the first game to introduce the concept of different breaths as permanent abilities and not just power-ups. Many have also come to appreciate the genuine attempt Check 6 and Equinox put forth to create a good product, even if the final version lacks many of their original design aspects. We could have even seen a real-time day and night cycle, among many other new ideas for the Spyro franchise. Into the Dragonfly did some things and I can't stress the sum part enough, things right in terms of pushing the series forward, even though it almost yanked it all the way back. It's truly a pity that this game took as much heat as it did from critics and fans upon its release. Pre-release articles and videos from companies like IGN and GameSpot contain a drastically different outlook on the game. It received hope and praise early on and seemed incredibly promising to most that previewed it. But in the end, many aspects fell short because of Universal's meddling, and as sad as it is to point fingers, that's just the truth. We can only hope that whatever comes next will be every bit the success Spyro deserved back then. Thank you so much for watching, guys. A huge shout out to everyone who participated, Mark for editing, and to ETD documentarian Mr. FO1 for helping me write this and providing so much behind the scenes information about this game. As always, don't forget to subscribe for more casual gaming content, and I will see you next time. Until then, this is Miharu, signing off.